Hi everyone, this is the lecture to accompany Chapter 9 in your textbook. Make sure you're familiar with the information in Chapter 9. Okay, let's talk about beginning and ending your speech. In Chapter 8 we discussed organizing the body of the speech. It's the largest part of your speech where most of your information is located and it needs to be organized effectively. But does that make it the most important part of your speech? If you think so, think again. All parts of your speech are important. Beginnings and endings of speeches are critical to the success of your speech. That's because of the primacy and the recency effects. The primacy effect has to do with first impressions. You're probably familiar with the saying, you never have a second chance to make a first impression. That's the primacy effect. An audience will remember their first impression of your speech, so you need to make a positive impact immediately. Then there's the recency effect, which states that we often remember the last impression we have of someone. Because of this, we're more likely to remember the last words out of your mouth, and that can be as powerful as our first impression of you. So, while the body is important because that's where you do the most work to fulfill your specific purpose statement, the introduction and the conclusion are critical to the audience's impression of you and their retention of the information you provide. So let's start by looking at the functions that your introduction needs to fulfill. An effective speech introduction fulfills four functions. First, you need to get the audience's attention. Second, you need to indicate the purpose and thesis of your speech. Third, you need to establish your credibility as a speaker on your topic. And finally, you need to preview your main points so the audience knows what to expect. Let's look at each of these functions separately. The first step is to get the audience's attention. How you do this depends on several things. What is your general and specific purpose? Is it a serious topic, a fun topic, an intellectual one? Are you trying to inform or persuade? These questions all play into your decision about how to begin your speech. You also need to consider the time you have to gain the audience's attention. Really, for a four to seven minute informative speech, you don't have a lot of time. Considering that you probably are going to spend at least three to five minutes on the body of your speech, you might have a minute for your entire introduction. Using your creativity, using typical attention getters, and also considering using PowerPoint, pictures, video, and other presentation media, that will help you here. These common attention getters work very well to move the audience into listening to you. In your research, you might find facts or statistics that surprise you. If they surprise you, there's no doubt they also will surprise your audience. You could begin with a story. If you're going to use this very effective tactic, make sure the story can be told briefly. You don't want to spend too long on it, just enough to lead well into your revelation of the topic. Jokes can be good if they're appropriate for the audience and lead well into the topic. Otherwise, choose another technique. If you have information about your audience that relates to the topic, like the results of a questionnaire you gave them, you can certainly use that. Or you could choose to begin by asking a pertinent question that leads well into the topic. You can ask a direct question, which is one that requires an audience response, but most speakers choose to ask rhetorical questions, which are thought-provoking questions that don't require a response, but that the audience expects the speaker to provide the answer to. In the example here, I start with an obvious fact that leads to a rhetorical question. Whatever attention getter you choose for your speech, make sure it's the first thing out of your mouth when you begin the speech. Don't begin by saying something like, so today I'm going to talk about popular dog breeds. If you do that, you've missed the opportunity to grab the attention of the audience and move it towards your topic instead of blurting out your topic right off the bat. Once you've gotten their attention, then it's the time to reveal and explain what your topic is and what you hope to let them know about it. It shouldn't take long, maybe just a sentence or two, but don't forget to do this step or the audience will be really confused. 
they need to understand the basic ideas that you're conveying in the speech. In this example, I reveal the topic to be the water system here in Las Vegas. I'm trying to get the audience to realize they probably don't know how water gets to them, but it might be a good idea for them to learn more about it. Then, you need to establish your credibility as a speaker about this topic. Some students want to skip this step because they think they're not an expert, or they feel a little weird about blowing their own horn, but it's critical to let the audience know what your interest and experience in the topic is. You don't have to be a PhD in your topic to be credible, but you do have to have some connection to the topic. Audiences are more likely to listen to you if you tell them that you have some experience with the topic, but they're also likely to listen to you if your experience with the topic consists mostly of the research you've done for the speech and the interest you have in the topic, as in this example. So, make sure you establish yourself as a credible speaker. The final function of the introduction is to preview the body of your speech. Tell us what the main points of the speech are going to be. This will establish an expectation in the minds of the audience about what they're going to be hearing, and it also helps them to know where you are in the body as you deliver the speech to them. This example is just one sentence, but all three main points are here. A good introduction should be about 15 to 20 percent of your speech. If you think of that in terms of time, for a five to six minute speech, which is a good time to shoot for in your informative speech, you probably want to stick to an introduction that's about a minute long. For a speech of seven to eight minutes, you don't want to go much more than a minute and a half. So you need to get our attention, reveal the topic, establish your credibility, and preview the main points within those time limits. Any longer than that and your speech is going to be too long. So you need to carefully craft your introduction to make sure it fulfills all of its functions in a reasonable amount of time. So let's put this whole introduction together so you can see how it flows and how it fulfills all the functions of a good introduction. The first thing is your attention getter. In this case, it starts with a fact that leads to a rhetorical question. Then the second thing is to reveal your purpose and topic. What is it that you want the audience to get from the speech? Then you state your credibility. In this case, talking about how I came to be interested in and do research on the topic. And finally, previewing the main points. In this case, there are three main points. One talking about the sources of water, another one talking about how it's treated at water treatment plants, and finally how it gets from there to our homes. So now I'm going to deliver it to you as if I were giving the speech so you can hear how it flows together. When you turn on the kitchen faucet, water comes out. That's something you just take for granted. But have you ever wondered where that water came from and how it got to your tap? The water that flows into your house comes from several sources. In the case of Las Vegas, it's from Colorado River water and groundwater. And as I said, we have tended to take its existence for granted without thinking too much about where it comes from or how it gets to us. But maybe it's time we did think about it. After all, water is an important resource. I admit I was ignorant about where our water comes from and the journey it takes to our homes. Then I took my niece and nephew to the Springs Preserve a local museum and botanical garden that's built over the underground springs where early Las Vegas residents got their water. I was fascinated by the water exhibit at the Charleston Heights pumping station, and I decided to learn more about the topic. So today I hope to inform you of what I've learned about the sources of our water, how it's treated to make sure it's safe, and the delivery system that brings it to your sink. Now, it took a little over a minute for the whole introduction. That's what you're aiming for as well. I hope you could hear how nicely it flows and how well it fulfills the functions of a good introduction. Okay, let's move on to the conclusion. Conclusions are generally the shortest part of the speech, around 30 seconds for a shorter speech to a minute or so for a longer speech. So, lots of people think that they're the least important part. But remember the recency effect. 
that states that audiences are likely to remember the last word you say or the last impression they have of you. So if the last thing they hear from you is, um, I guess that's all, or I'm done, or I don't have anything else, or that's it, their impression of you is not going to be very good. An effective conclusion fulfills three functions. It reviews and summarizes the main points, reinforces the specific purpose, and provides a sense of closure. Let's look at these three functions. Once you've transitioned to the conclusion, you'll need to review or summarize the main points. Simply put, you need to remind us of the main points, briefly and without specific details. You don't necessarily want to repeat the exact wording you used in the preview. Reword it, but keep the same idea. As in this example, today I informed you about Las Vegas' water delivery system, where our water comes from, and how it gets to us safely. Now that's just one sentence, but everything is in there. Then you need to ensure that the audience remembers why you gave the speech in the first place. Remind them of your purpose and use memorable messages and striking examples to bring home the point. In the introduction of the water speech, I talked about how we take water for granted, but maybe we need to understand the process better, so that's reiterated here. The final words of your conclusion need to bring a sense of closure to the speech. Don't leave your audience hanging. The techniques you can use here are fairly similar to the things that you used in the introduction to get the audience's attention. You could end with a quote, as I did in this example, with a picture, a short video, or audio clip, a dramatic statement that's particularly effective because it leaves the audience thinking seriously about what you said. You can also refer back to something you mentioned in the introduction. That gives a very solid circular pattern to your speech that's a nice way to end. You could also refer to subsequent events or something that could happen or did happen as a result of the topic. Reinforce that speaker-audience connection by talking about things we all have in common as they relate to the topic. And you can certainly thank the audience for their time. In fact, saying thank you after your closing statement is pretty standard. However, you need to make sure that the closing statement conveys an actual sense of closure. If it doesn't, and you just end with thank you, your audience is going to be confused. Okay, so let's see the conclusion of this speech as it would appear in your complete sentence outline. Don't forget, you need a transition to move from the last main point into the conclusion. Then you would label the conclusion and write it out in its entirety. The first part is the review of your main points. The second part is reinforcing the specific purpose of the speech or what you wanted the audience to get out of the speech. And the last part is where you provide a sense of closure. In this case, I use a quotation. Now I'm going to deliver it as if I were giving the speech so that you can see how it flows nicely together and fulfills the functions of a conclusion. Today I informed you about Las Vegas' water delivery system, where our water comes from and how it gets to us safely. Remember, it's important that we don't take this resource for granted, and I hope that your new understanding of this complex process has given you a deeper appreciation for it. This is the desert, after all, and the fact that we have such an effective water delivery system is pretty amazing. So the next time you turn on the kitchen tap, remember the words of the great American anthropologist Lauren Isley. If there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. Thank you. Okay, you're ready to go to MindTap.